Uh, Michael asked me to talk about the state of affairs uh, politically in Israel-Palestine. So when you uh, left congregational ministry a few years ago, you became the Midwest Regional Director of the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers. I know as an activist you had worked with, the, with a number of your Quakers, uh, Quaker friends uh, and colleagues uh, in various activism uh, throughout the Chicago area. You received an award from the American Friends Service Committee as a Jew, as a rabbi, uh, what did you learn from your work with the Quakers? That's a great question. Yes, I was very much working in uh, coalition with the American Friends Service Committee and the Quakers. And uh, I always had admiration for them, uh, even before I, before I started working with them uh, professionally. And one of the things that really Im impressed me, and I think um, I learned in a very important way when I started to work with them and become part of that community, is that it is, it is truly an organization, uh, a Quaker organization, a faith-based organization, that really walks the walk of their ideals even when it becomes uh, very, very unpopular. Uh, and there's lots of examples I could give. Shortly after I started working for American Friends, I was asked to speak on Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, by the Japanese American community in uh, Chicago. Uh, and it turns out that the reason I was being asked to represent AFSC was because when FDR passes executive order imprisoning Japanese Americans before World, uh, during World War II, AFSC was the only organization in the country that actually opposed that order. Well, even, that. even the ACLU did not oppose well, it. I didn't realize that. And not only did they oppose it, they went into camps and actively got people out. They got scholarships for college-age Japanese Americans. Um, and I didn't know that, but Japanese Americans know it. And they asked me to come and speak, and I spoke on a panel there. You know, I, I, I quickly did a quick study on the history of it and spoke on a panel. And afterwards, I mean, there were survivors there. There were children and grandchildren of survivors. A woman came up to me in tears thanking me. Uh, and that was a really powerful moment uh, because I was also aware that as a Jew, AFSC worked with Jewish refugees after the Holocaust and actively uh, worked to help resettle them and yeah. do relief efforts. And I was also well aware that uh, in 1948, 1949, AFSC was asked by the United Nations to go to Gaza to work with Palestinians who had been turned into refugees after the Nakba, after the disp Israel's dispossession of Palestinians. And one of the things that really struck me when I, when I learned about this was that they, they went and they said, we will do this, but we will not do this indefinitely uh, because there needs to be a political solution to this. Uh, and uh, Clarence Pickett, who was the general secretary at the time, made this very clear to the UN. And it became clear that uh, there was gonna be no, that Israel would not allow Palestinians to return and that there was not gonna be a political settlement. AFSC said we can't in good faith continue to do this. And that's when UNRWA, uh, the UN organization that actually <laughs> serves refugees in Gaza and elsewhere, was created. Um, so that moral conviction and willingness to put themselves on the line was very, very important to me as a Jew, both historically in terms of their being there for my own people, but actually I believe that's not only a Quaker testimony, Quaker value, it's a, it's a deep, see the Jewish value of standing up against oppression and bearing witness uh, to people who are being persecuted and actively uh, standing with them, I believe is a, a, one of a central, if not the most central uh, tenet of my faith tradition. So I felt as a Jew, uh, very, very validated um, and, and felt very comfortable working within a Quaker context for that reason.